Hi, I'm Richard Murray, a professional triathlete, and you're watching me on runforestrun.tv. Hi, I'm Richard Murray, a professional triathlete uh, from South Africa. I'm now competing for the Netherlands the last few years. Uh, we're here in uh, sunny Gold Coast, Australia. And yeah, we're currently training, doing a training camp uh, for the Paris Olympics 2024 for qualification. And the next big race is Yokohama World Triathlon Series race in Japan. So I grew up in uh, South Africa in the northern suburbs um, in Durbanville, which is kind of the direction of Stellenbosch, not Durban, where most people think Durbanville is from. Um, yeah, and I grew up uh, in school, doing school sports. So luckily in South Africa, there's a lot of different school sports available from running. Um, there was even cycling as well when I was at school, like technical cycling as well with a coach. I had a cycling coach when I was at primary school already. Um, I ran track and field uh, when I was a kid as well and uh, did biathlon or biathlon, so run, swim, run, um, and duathlon when I grew up, uh, kind of going towards my mid-teens to late teens. Um, yeah, I went through then to do duathlon, so my running and biking was good and my swimming was not so good, so um, I focused, looked towards duathlon, and uh, uh, quite shortly after that, I got told if I learned to swim, I could become a professional triathlete, which I did not want to do any swimming whatsoever. I found it terrible, but, uh, here we are and yeah, uh, I learned to swim. It took me probably about three, four years to get swimming up to scratch. Uh, I started swimming when I was about 17 years old. Uh, I think when I was 20, my PB for 1500 was 25 minutes when I was about 20 years old. So um, I had a lot of work to do. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how my progression started uh, through sports from when I was young to starting to be a professional triathlete when I was uh, about 20, 21 years of age. So my first uh, professional season, I think, if I'm not mistaken, was 2010, 2011 in that, uh, in that year. And uh, my first camp was actually in Potsdam in uh, up close to Johannesburg, um, an altitude camp. So I packed my Volkswagen Golf completely to the roof with all my stuff, drove up to Potsdam about 1200 kilometers from Cape Town, uh, actually with another triathlete, Vicky van der Mava. She's actually trying to qualify now for South Africa for the Olympics as well. Um, and yeah, we went there for a camp. I ended up spending about two, three months odd, much longer than expected in Potsdam. I almost became a resident. Uh, and yeah, the season pretty much started. Then uh, I started racing uh, in South Africa early season. So I did South Africa summer season, European summer season, and back to South Africa summer season all in one year in 2010. Uh, and yeah, it was a, kind of my in introduction to professional racing. Um, I did a couple of international triathlons, nothing massive of caliber, but at the end of the year, I think I raced a World Cup in Huatulco in Mexico. Uh, that was kind of my really big breakthrough type of event. I got onto the podium there uh, in the heat, and yeah, that was kind of the, you know, the start of, of my career in 2010 as a professional. Yeah, so 2011, um, I don't think the Olympics was even, well, I didn't say the Olympics wasn't on my mind, but I think when I was already in high school, I had an idea of trying to get to the Olympics. I wasn't really certain on what sport probably it was yet, but uh, I wanted to go to the Olympics and 2011 um, actually came through to Wollongong, uh, which was my first international training camp here in Australia. Uh, I joined kind of Jamie Turner and the Australian uh, triathlon squad uh, down in Wollongong uh, before the Sydney World Triathlon Series race there. Um, yeah, it was a nice place to train. I, I, I quickly realized that my training was not the same as it is in Australia. I definitely was training much easier and different type of intensities, so it was quite in the deep end for me. Um, you know, 2011 was definitely my, I would say my breakthrough uh, year. And uh, yeah, um, that's the year where I kind of learned, uh, yeah, different international training groups. Uh, I spent the first summer in Europe as well, uh, in Germany racing Bundesliga. And uh, yeah, the, the year progressed pretty quickly. Um, we were all of a sudden then in 2012, uh, I got onto my first World Triathlon Series podium. So 2011 was my first World Triathlon Series race in Hamburg, uh, where it was Olympic distance still, I remember, and I DNF because I was really sick leading into the race and I couldn't find the medical uh, doctor there to pull out the race. So I dove in, literally swam around. The crowds were so massive that I didn't actually quit after the first lap of the swim. I dove in for a second lap of the swim just because the crowds were so big that I couldn't stop. Uh, eventually have to pull out during the race, but that was my first experience at DNF in a World Series. Uh, and fast forward to the year later, I ended up winning World Triathlon Series Hamburg in 2012, uh, the year of the Olympics. So uh, it was a big change all in one year. Um, also in Sydney, I came here to train again in Australia. 
Um, got on my first World Series podium in Sydney where I got, uh, I think it was third position um, in Sydney behind uh, Stefan Eustace and uh, I think uh, yeah, Vidal from France. Um, and yeah, so that year I got on my first three World Series podiums. Uh, I was pretty much leading the World Series as well that year in my first season of racing World Series. Uh, and yeah, leading up to the Olympics, you know, all of a sudden I went from, you know, an unknown-ish to maybe be having a possible and a medal. And I knew that a sprint distance and an Olympic distance, they're kind of two different disciplines a little bit or two different, the distances are quite, sometimes the results can be different. Um, so I knew that. Uh, but yeah, I managed to qualify uh, late two months before the Games, got told I, I can compete in London. And uh, yeah, London was then my first Olympics. Yeah, so the London Olympics 2012, uh, I think I was 23 years old. Felt like I was 18 years old actually. Um, well, mentally anyway, going to the Olympic Games, uh, walking in the Olympic Village, seeing Usain Bolt, uh, walking through the village, people like screaming and shouting. Uh, it was quite a quite a moment that I, you know that I'll never forget. I think your first Olympics is always one that you'll cherish, probably I'd say the most because you're young and, and and there's so much going on. And I think it's probably takes you one or two Olympics is to get into the rhythm of how it works and to become more professional and and you know, uh, make, you know put yourself in the be more focused before the race and not be a uh, you know your head all up in the clouds before the the race happens. Um, so yeah, London was I think I can't remember I think I came 27th or 22nd or something like that. I had a sprint finish with Courtney Atkinson. Actually, I won't forget that because he actually put me to the line. So another Australian guy put me to the finish. But um, yeah, the race happened as I thought it might. There was a breakaway with the Brownleys, Stuart Hayes and them. And uh, unfortunately, there was no chance of us being able to close them down. We tried to work well in the chase group, uh, but all the firepower was up front with the, the Russians and Stuart Hayes and the Brownleys. And unfortunately, there was almost no chance of us coming back on the bike after the swim deficit of about a minute. Um, and then on the run, yeah, I ran okay, but I think my motivation was kind of gone a little bit by the time we got onto the run. And uh, yeah, I still think I ran pretty okay for my first Olympics, but yeah, I think the, yeah, it was definitely not what I wanted, but you know, I think the Olympics don't always, don't always go the same as other races. It's always something, the Olympics is a completely unique race. In 2012, then I decided to join an international training group. So I think the grand final in 2012 was in Auckland. Um, and uh, Joel Filio uh, was working with the Canadian national team. He then decided to start an international training group, uh, which we started, I think, in April 2013 was the first year that the group came together in Florida, uh, in Claremont. And uh, yeah, I joined that group. I spoke to Joel actually at the grand final in Auckland already. I spoke to him and heard that things, some things were happening. So I decided to join their group. Uh, the likes of Mario Mola also joined and uh, Sarah Groff and a couple of good Americans. And uh, the group was, pretty strong um, from the start and uh, I think Vincent Louis then also came on a little bit later as well and so this, the group was pretty strong and I spent about four or five I think about five or six odd years with that uh, international training group uh, I definitely like managed to get consistent World Series races some more podiums and things you know was rolling very very well over the, the next few years uh, leading up until the Rio Olympics in 2016 um, at the test event in 2015, I pre-qualified for Rio, so going into the Olympics in Rio, I, I knew that I had qualified, so I didn't have stress. Um, and yeah, training was going perfectly in 2016 and, until I came to the Gold Coast, uh, overcooked a corner on the bike and ended up breaking my collarbone into three pieces on the Gold Coast. And uh, that was about four months before the Rio Olympics, so uh, yeah, definitely was the pretty much not the worst timing, but close to the worst timing. Um, and I had set two months out of training. Uh, and yeah, heading into the Olympics was, yeah, I had a lot, to, a lot of work to do from, from April towards uh, August. Yeah, so uh, in, in Rio Olympics, uh, I kind of did everything I could. Um, coming with a broken collarbone, I sat out two months of training. From swimming side, I, I could practically couldn't swim, my shoulder was healing. Uh, I got into the pool, I think about two weeks later, and I was sculling and kicking. I couldn't do anything above the shoulder, so I was sculling and kicking about 2Ks pretty much most days in the pool just to keep the water feel, which uh, definitely did some damage to my mentality a tiny bit. It was staring at the bottom of the pool, not really swimming, it was tough, but I knew that it would pay dividends. Uh, and I was still walking on the treadmill, I couldn't run yet, so I put a big incline on the treadmill and I was getting a big workout on the, on the treadmill, trying to uh, emulate what it would be like to run, kind of keep the muscles intact and everything. Um, and yeah, I think about eight weeks after breaking my collarbone, I decided, well, I can't swim, I may as well do a duathlon again. So then I went to duathlon world champs 
uh, 2016. Uh, yeah, where I ended up winning the World Jathlon Champs uh, for a third time in my career, which was quite uh, something cool. I didn't expect to even be there, but uh, parents came with and got a world title there going before the Olympics, which was cool. Um, and then, yeah, they led into to Rio Olympics, uh, where obviously I knew on the swim I would be in, in, a, in a bad place. I didn't realize it would be that bad. I was about a minute and a half out on the swim on the Brownlees and the other guys out the water. Uh, my coaches and them thought I should literally pull the plug. My race is finished, but uh, on the bike I was really strong and worked well with uh, with the chase group a bit. And on the run I had one of the quickest run splits of the day, I think about 20, 30 odd seconds, which I was pretty happy with. And I managed to run my way up to fourth position, which was so close to the podium. Um, but I think we, you know, it just wasn't to be that day. And uh, some people wonder, you know, they think, oh, fourth place, you know, that's bad. But I think if I look back, I was four months before that I had a broken collarbone. Uh, I would have signed for fourth place in any day of the week. So I think you've always got to look towards, you know, what you can do with the situation. Uh, and I think out of that situation, I was pretty happy with where it ended up. Yeah, so from the Rio Olympics in 2016, um, we headed into the 2017 uh, year and that year we decided to do some fun things. Uh, there was the birth of Super League Triathlon uh, in Hamilton Island in 2017. So we, we ended up coming back to the Gold Coast again, doing some training. Um, Hamilton Island was the first Super League triathlon event, uh, which was pretty crazy. Three days of racing, um, and I managed to win that one, which is kind of one of the biggest, I say the biggest wins of my career, but financially it was probably one of the biggest wins of my career, apart from the Island House triathlons, which they had in the Bahamas uh, as well. So some a little bit different than World Series racing events. Um, and yeah, so uh, that year was quite exciting. They also had the whole, I think the following year, they had the series of the Super League series coming around. Uh, now it's Super Tri, I think it's been changed to Super Tri, but um, yeah, it was uh, quite a cool year. We had some good fun. I think we did our first half distance. We did Challenge uh, Samarin as well in 2017, first half distance race, uh, which I thought I would have enjoyed more than it actually than I than I did. Uh, it was a pretty tough race, so my first half distance. Um, and yeah, I think I ended up coming fifth or sixth odd against Brownlee and Saunders and some other really uber bikers, Keenley and stuff. So there was some pretty strong field for my first half distance race. Uh, 2017, Rachel also competed. She had a, she also had a pretty good race, and then coming fourth or something uh, against Lucy Charles. I think she won that. That was kind of her breakthrough type race. And yeah, 2017 to 2000 and about 19 odd, uh, we changed. So we we stopped working with Joel Filio and, and the group. We kind of went a bit independent. We started working with the Dutch Triathlon Federation. So uh, Louis De La Haye and Jordi Willenberg, who was uh, kind of heading up the Dutch Triathlon uh, coaching regime. Um, we decided we wanted to be more in the Netherlands, a little bit more at home, not travel as much, not live out the suitcase. Uh, after about eight or ten years living out the suitcase, it was time to settle a tiny bit, spend more time in the Netherlands, uh, actually have friends and people that you see that's outside of triathlon as well. Uh, and yeah, so 2019, uh, towards uh, Tokyo Olympics, uh, the, the full focus was then on obviously, uh, yeah, pretty much getting ready for Tokyo for the Olympics. So, uh, enter COVID 2020. Uh, probably I was in some very I was in some very good shape at this time of the year. I remember uh, being in Namibia, uh, training there before the first race in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I don't think I'll forget the the cyclists being in hotels in Abu Dhabi and uh, they got locked down, stuck in some hotels, and everyone was wondering should we even go to Abu Dhabi? And uh, a week later. Um, yeah, we found some pretty hectic news that Rachel Palmer's, uh, Rachel's mother got uh, kind of like a terminal uh, kind of a disease that she got. She got a some cancerous disease and, and she only had a few months to live. So 2020 was an absolute nightmare. Rachel's mother passed away. Uh, COVID happened. Um, we went to the Netherlands where we got a semi-lockdown there. At least we could still go outside and we could still exercise in the Netherlands, which was great. Uh, but 2020 was pretty much a, a bit of a nightmare for everyone, I think. Motivation was low, people, you know, uh, businesses were shut down, the whole world was pretty much shut down. So 2020, I think a lot of people, not people that want to forget, but many people died all over the world. Uh, it was a bit of a crazy time, actually. And uh, I think in some sense, it's probably, I wouldn't say that it was good for the world to have something to slow the world down. But um, yeah, it's definitely, uh, it was a pretty tough year in 2020. Um, the Olympics got postponed, so motivation was completely gone as well as a, from a triathlon perspective. Um, and yeah, so I think 2021, the Olympics came around. Um, start of the year, uh, picked up a hot condition, so I got AFib uh, at the start of 2021. 
um, which was a big problem because I thought my career was pretty much completely finished. I got told by the first cardiologist that I should just quit sport and get a normal job. That was the first uh, thing. He said, yeah, just go and get a normal job. Uh, and that literally broke me for a few weeks. Uh, didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Uh, I mean, I studied coaching and conditioning and I have a passion for coaching and for sports science. So I know what I want to do when I stop. But I mean, to be told you had to stop was a different story versus deciding you were going to stop. Uh, so 2021, um, I got a second opinion. My Dutch coach has had a few athletes that had the same problem. They went to the same uh, certain cardiologist in the Netherlands who was very renowned for working on people's hearts. Uh, I did the same route. I said, OK, it's not over until it's over. Um, and uh, I went and got an ablation. So I think two months before the Olympics, because I was on a waiting list to try and get an ablation done, I had to wait a few weeks. So. I was like on standby uh, and uh, got an ablation eventually done, decided to go to the Olympics. A lot of people think I went to, well, the word on the street was that I went to the Olympics to have fun, to hang out with Rachel. That was what apparently what word on the street is. Whether that's true or not, definitely incorrect. Um, I went there full focus on the relay for South Africa. I knew for the individual race that my heart would not be ready. It was like two months after having an ablation, it would be absolute insanity to go and do a two hour event. It would just be the stupidest thing to try and do so I decided to just do the relay if I hadn't gone there South Africa would have forfeit the relay country would have no relay and I'm quite a passionate human being so I thought that that was a, bigger than myself to go there with the relay to try and keep the country to have a relay um, and unfortunately little did I know that I went to the Olympics and uh, Henry Schoeman had an ankle injury which we didn't know anything about going there um, and so I kind of got told as well at the start that the chance of the relay happening is next to none because Henry might obviously do the individual race and his ankle might blow out and that's exactly what happened. I went to the Olympics in Tokyo and it happened, Henry's ankle blew out, they cancelled the relay, they told us we had to leave in two days time, book your own tickets, please leave, um, self-funded tickets to leave as well, which I told them they can deport me, I'm staying here, I will stay here and I will support the Dutch um, racing uh, at the Olympics because Rachel's going to compete and uh, I did, my own Olympi I did my own Olympic triathlon in the village because I was bored as hell and I was angry with the whole situation. I went on like a pin hunting, so I tried to get all the pins possible from all different countries, keep myself entertained, and I did my own little village triathlon. I swam in a fountain, cycled around the thing and did a run on the, on the track, put my suit on, tried to get an Olympic feel because I couldn't get one any other way. And um, I think that video, I actually made a YouTube video on that somewhere about it. And I bruised my ribs because I was on pain, I was on blood thinners, so I swam on a fountain and bruised the crap out of my ribs because I was on blood thinners, which I forgot about. Um, but it was pretty, it was a very crazy year. The Dutch ended up coming fourth. Uh, I actually had them coming third on paper, technically the Dutch, and they came fourth, so it was a pretty close one. Um, and yeah, I think from that, it kind of sparked the idea for me to compete for the Dutch in some way. Um, people that were supporting me were, I have two Dutch coaches, my wife is Dutch, I traveled uh, with a Dutch international team to a pre-camp before Tokyo with them. Um, so I was kind of like a, you know, an extra plus one Dutchie from 2018-19 odd with my coaching structure, living there and um, this kind of sparked the idea of me to compete for the Netherlands um, from there uh, as well as in the future I just plan on living in the Netherlands and setting up a business and the coaching business and that type of thing. So uh, this was the biggest change deciding factor for me to switch nationalities. Um, I still have South African nationalities. A lot of people think I've become a traitor because I race for another country. But um, the real fact is if you have opportunity in another place and you want to do that, then it becomes a business venture as well as a private venture. So it's a bit of both. So yeah, that's the, that was how the whole change happened for me to look to race for the Netherlands. So now it comes to my final Olympic Games, hopefully, if I qualify. <laughs> um, in Paris 2024, uh, we're now currently uh, on the Gold Coast in Australia, busy uh, training for uh, the Yokohama World Triathlon Series event where I have a shot at qualification. Uh, I need a top eight position there in Yokohama, uh, or I need to have a top eight position in Cagliari two weeks later. And there's also a team relay in between that in Mexico. So three weekends of racing, qualification almost at each weekend, uh, which is going to be pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, the fitness is getting there slowly, uh, the heart's playing ball, which is also quite important. Uh, that has to work in order to actually, uh, yeah, to function as a professional athlete. So uh, it's been going pretty well at the start of this year. The first race in Abu Dhabi got cancelled, uh, unfortunately due to extreme weather, which was a bit of a, 
the pity um, and the whole plans changed my uh, I don't have Dutch nationality as of yet and that's a big thing that needs to also get done so before I left the Netherlands I had issues with my birth certificate from South Africa that was not accepted and so there's a whole paperwork issues that needs to be resolved luckily that's all been done and now I'm waiting on kind of my nationality to go to the ceremony and collect my passport to officially become Dutch and hope, hope and pray that that makes it in time before Paris otherwise I won't be able to race because I'm not Dutch um, and yeah so there's a lot still hanging on the line but you know I think things in life there's always something that needs to be done and uh, I think that's what makes life exciting and worth living um, so that, this is the goal Paris 2024 my biggest one was to actually compete with Rachel in the relay a husband and wife in the relay for the Netherlands and uh, yeah I hope this comes true we'll see in uh, in about two or three months whether it happens so yeah I've got three weekends racing coming up uh, in a row uh, Yokohama uh, in Japan which comes up in a week and a half's time. Um, that's uh, I've podiumed there before uh, in the past, so I'm hoping this is going to be my biggest shot at qualifying for the games. Uh, then the weekend after that is the relay qualification event for the teams that have not pre-qualified for Paris. Um, so the field is not as strong as it usually is in the relays. Uh, we need a top two position there from the Netherlands in order to qualify. If we qualify the team, I can start individually as well. So there's two chances the first two weekends and there's one weekend after that one which is in Italy, um, which is in Cagliari, uh, which is going to be a hit or miss. If I don't qualify in the first two races, I'm going to go to Yokohama, go to Cagliari to just try my luck. Um, probably won't be the best after all the jet lag and all the travel and all everything, but I think, uh, you know, uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. You've got to try and put all your cards on the table. If there's nothing left, you've got to go, go all in. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Hopefully the three weekends in a row is going to be quite epic. Yeah, so my week, me, weekly mileage um, is nothing super spectacular. I probably do 20 to 25 kilometers a week swimming, uh, 25, 28 being kind of on the high end. Um, then on the biking, I do about 250 to 350 k's a week cycling. Um, and for the running, I do anywhere from 50 to 80 kilometers of a week running. Um, it has been slightly less than I did when I was in my 20s. So then I used to do almost 30 hour training weeks with up to 100 k's of running, about 400 of bike and about the same swimming. Um, and now obviously I'm getting a little bit older. Obviously I had a hot condition as well. I've had to bring things back a tiny bit, take the intensity out. So I used to have two in probably about six and 10 sessions when I was younger. Now I'm 35, I have about four, five sometimes in 10 sessions in the week. Um, and quite a lot of general base mileage, but over the years I've built up some good strength. So about 20 to 25 hours in a week is about general training week for me now. So I haven't like officially announced anything per se uh, on whether I retire or not at the end of the season. Uh, but after after the Tokyo, or sorry, after the Paris Olympic Games, um, I've already started coaching. So the last year I've, picked up, I've got about five or six other athletes that I coach. Uh, trying to see how it is to, to grab a feel of coaching. Uh, Rich and I intend to start a coaching business. Uh, so at the end of the year, you'll be able to subscribe and to yeah to 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 get some training plans from us if you if you'd like. And uh, we've recently also now purchased um, a property in the Netherlands, uh, a farm uh, which is going to be in the direction of sport as well. Uh, we haven't done anything yet, but uh, you can follow, take a look online. It's uh, at the Alsti. Um, we're going to be posting things there and explaining what's going to be done and how we're going to do things in the future. Uh, we haven't we haven't announced that yet either, so that's also still under the wraps a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit our plan. So coaching, uh, we'll continue to do some form, obviously, of triathlon. But uh, I think after the Olympics, that we have some other things on our minds that we want to do. Uh, but we still do intend to do some triathlon events uh, in the near future. Yeah, so big shout out, obviously, to my supporters. Uh, I think my biggest ones being uh, my family, friends, coaches, um, you know, anyone that's been there to give me the the cheer up or, you know, uh, you know, drop a comment and those types of things. I think those things also help in, in life to keep you motivated and keep you focused. Uh, my sponsors as well, uh, the, the Dutch triathlon team has been a real big one the last the last years or two, uh, financing, obviously, all uh, my travel, my events and those things and stuff, without them it wouldn't be possible. Um, then I've got to see my, main, my other big sponsors, BMC, DT Swiss on the bike side. Uh, they've been doing my bikes, wheel sets and things for the last five odd years, so it's quite important for them. Uh, we've got a new brand we started with, Squirt Cycling, who does chain lube and sealants and those things as well. Uh, big shout out to them, they've been helping us, Vita Cycling Kit, 
Capus helmets, Oakley. Um, yeah, I've got a whole bunch. If you want to go and check them out, you can have a look at my sponsors, uh, already underscore Murray uh, on Instagram. And uh, yeah, a big shout out obviously to my support supporters and sponsors. Without them, it wouldn't be possible. So anyone watching uh, the Olympics or, or watching the athletes competing and getting ready for the Olympics, um, a piece of advice, you know, would be uh, always believe uh, in yourself. Uh, try and get a good uh, team around you of people that help support you and, you know, bring you up and not bring you down. Um, I think that's really important. And obviously, you need to believe that anything is possible. I think it's a very overused term, uh, but you need to obviously believe in your ability, stay focused, realize that, you know, nothing comes overnight. I think uh, people are getting used to things being so easily obtainable and just getting things nowadays and you realize some things take five years some some things you know take 10 years uh and i think if you if you put that in the back of your mind uh, and you're willing to work hard on it that uh, yeah almost anything is possible